people. Um, once again, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Russell. I teach in the School of Business at Mount St. Mary College. My, my uh, area of specialty is sports management. Uh, but the reason that I will be speaking to you today has nothing to do with sports nor sports management and everything to do with teaching online. Uh, I have been teaching online for approximately six and a half to seven years. Uh, I also use online resources quite a bit for the traditional classes that I teach uh, here at Mount St. Mary College, also in my previous teaching position at Western Connecticut State University. And I will be teaching a hybrid course uh, here at Mount St. Mary College in the School of Business uh, during, the, uh, during the upcoming spring semester. Um, so the welcome screen reminds you that we will be recording this. For those of you who aren't able to join us today, uh, this, uh, this webinar will be available. Um, and we'll certainly make sure that all files uh, associated with the presentation are sent out so that everybody has access to those. Uh, I certainly won't keep the picture of my face on the screen for very long, but again, there's my name and credentials. I am in my first year here at the School of Business. And so I'll begin by just giving you a little bit of background on my online teaching experience. Uh, and I'll start by explaining that when I first had the opportunity to start teaching online, uh, I was approached by a, a, a good friend who had been teaching for the University of Phoenix since about 2005 at that point. Uh, and I vehemently uh, was, I was vehemently opposed to the idea of teaching uh, online. Uh, I very much enjoy teaching in a traditional classroom. I consider myself to be a people person, enjoy face-to-face uh, -face contact and uh, personal interactions. Uh, and in a previous career, I had been a computer programmer, which had caused me to sit in front of a computer screen for many, many hours of the day. And I perceived that teaching online was going to take me back to that way of life where I would be uh, in an environment, in a situation where I would find myself staring at a computer screen for many, many hours, lacking uh, interpersonal uh, contact and communication. And, and so I was very reluctant, uh, but I decided to give the, the University of Phoenix a try, uh, went through their extensive training program, uh, taught a course where I was mentored by a, a senior member of their, their teaching faculty. And what I actually found when I started to teach in the online environment was that uh, I, I, I very much enjoyed it. I very much enjoyed the interaction. Uh, it wasn't at all an isolation type of experience. Uh, it, it is an asynchronous experience with the University of Phoenix. In fact, all of the, the teaching that I've done online has been asynchronous. I've used some some video lectures and I've recorded some audio, uh, but I have not yet ever taught in a class where there were any uh, synchronous portions of the course. All of my teaching experience has been, uh, has been asynchronous. And so I taught for the University of Phoenix for several years and uh, actually even taught a few traditional classes for the University of Phoenix at their campus in Norwalk, Connecticut. And about three years ago, so about 2013, the University of Phoenix changed their teaching model rather significantly. Uh, and fortunately for me, I had also started to teach for Ashford University, but only very sparingly uh, for Ashford at first. Uh, but when the University of Phoenix changed their teaching model, and by that I mean they dramatically increased the size of their classes. Um, when I first started teaching for the University of Phoenix, the average class size was 12 to 15. Sometimes a class might approach 18 or 19 students, but I don't think in the first three or four years that I taught for the University of Phoenix, I ever got to, 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 to uh, 20 students in a course. And suddenly I was teaching, at the time I was teaching two classes at a time for the University of Phoenix, uh, and suddenly I had 35 to 40 students in each of those classes. And so I, uh, I really wasn't very fond of that. Uh, that change in their teaching methods. Uh, and so I began to focus more heavily on Ashford University, which continues to this day to, to, to have smaller class sizes. In fact, the uh, Ashford teaching model, if a course ever gets to uh, 25 students, uh, they take that group and they split it in half and simply uh, offer another section of the course. So I, I currently, I, I am still in uh, an active member of the Ashford faculty, uh, although I am not as 
as active now that I am teaching full-time uh, here at Mount St. Mary College, but I do continue to teach uh, during our breaks. I'm scheduled to teach a statistics class during uh, the months of December and January, and I'll make myself available next summer uh, to, uh, to continue to teach for Ashford University. Uh, some of the classes that I've taught, just to, to give you an example of the, I think, the diversity uh, of classes that are available in the online environment for the University of Phoenix. Uh, I taught a number of courses in health and wellness. Uh, many of those classes included uh, outdoor activities uh, relating to health and fitness. Of course, I wasn't there with uh, my students participating in those activities, but I, I facilitated them um, electronically online. For Ashford University, uh, I, I've uh, taught primarily uh, the uh, statistics and uh, research methods classes. Uh, so I've, I've, I've taught a variety of, of different classes for uh, both the University of Phoenix and for uh, Ashford University. So to explain how the process of teaching uh, in an online environment uh, happens, how it begins, uh, very much like a traditional teaching position. Uh, there is an application process. The online schools interview, uh, well, they, they, they post positions for uh, specific needs, very much like a, a traditional college. Uh, and so you apply for, uh, uh, for an opportunity to teach uh, in a very specific area, uh, and you're interviewed for that area. Uh, once you're on the faculty, if you find that there are other courses that you, you believe you're qualified to teach, you certainly can discuss that with the schedulers, uh, with the people to whom you report. Uh, but your, your foot in the door really is to find that one class, uh, that, one, that one class that the online school is looking for, for which you have uh, a background uh, in teaching. Um, once you're hired, uh, you go through extensive training, uh, which I find to be uh, quite a bit different from my experiences in, uh, on traditional campuses. Uh, my online training course for uh, the University of Phoenix was a five-week course, uh, required approximately 20 hours a week uh, of my time during those five weeks. And after those five weeks, I was then assigned to a five-week course that I taught. And during that session, I was mentored by someone who probably assigned me more homework than I assigned my students. It was a very rigorous uh, five weeks, both teaching, grading, uh, and fulfilling my own uh, requirements to my mentor. But the uh, the process of having a mentor in the first class that you teach uh, really helps you fill in uh, any of those last details that you might not have absorbed from the uh, training sessions uh, that you attend. Uh, my mentor in particular uh, had a very specific way of um, using checklists to make sure that she followed uh, all, of the, uh, all of the recommendations and suggestions from the University of Phoenix. Every instructor has a list of items that they're required to complete on a weekly basis pertaining to your participation in discussion forums, uh, the, the timeliness with which you grade, the, the, the type of grading and feedback that you give to students, the type of uh, encouragement that you provide to students, uh, the way that you stay engaged in your classroom and and uh, facilitate uh, uh, discussion and engagement with uh, with the students. And my mentor had a, a very extensive list of mostly Microsoft Word and Excel files, but so not a not exactly a very high tech way of of, of tracking her progress uh, every week, but. Uh, it, since then, I've used something very, very similar. I've tweaked it my tweaked it to my own uh, my own style. But um, uh, my mentor was very, very good at filling in uh, a lot of the gaps and giving me some some tips and suggestions on how to make the process of teaching uh, just a little bit easier. If when you're teaching in an online environment, if you choose to, you can spend an an extraordinary number of hours. Uh, engaging students in dialogue, grading in papers and quizzes and exams. Uh, but if you streamline the process, uh, you really can, uh, can, can stay on top of uh, the number of hours and make it, uh, make it much, much more manageable. So after you've gone through the training process and after you've taught a course as a mentor, uh, then your name 
goes into the database of qualified instructors to teach uh, the, initially the first course uh, for which you were hired. And then, as I said, if you see uh, other courses on the university's offering that you believe you are qualified for, you can submit uh, a request and your resume. Uh, and then as openings come up or as the schedulers perhaps need extra people uh, for certain classes, they uh, add your name to the rotation. Uh, in those classes. Um, and, oh, right, uh, excuse the pause there. One other thing that I neglected to mention, something that I found very, very helpful in particular when I first started teaching, uh, every online school has a variety of faculty discussion boards. And especially for new faculty, for first timers, it's a very, very useful place to go, post questions. Uh, you know, they always say that there's, uh, you know, no, no question is a bad question or no question is a stupid question. And in particular, uh, teaching in an environment like that where you're brand new, posting a question so that seasoned members of the faculty can respond, or perhaps even some other new members of the faculty who may uh, have a little bit of experience uh, with the question that you're asking uh, can really be uh, very, very helpful. So that was a valuable resource for me to get up and going and uh, get my first couple of classes rolling. So th the next thing that I wanted to do is, is give an example of what an online class looks like. Of course, in any environment, the online uh, learning system has its own uh, unique differences. Uh, the University of Phoenix uh, and Ashford University have, uh, in, in, in those two schools in similarity, sorry, those two schools in similarity have the, their, their structure is uh, it's, uh, weekly driven. Uh, so in other words, uh, for Ashford University, you uh, participate in week one and you complete every component of week one before you advance to week two. Uh, the University of Phoenix has a very, very similar, uh, very similar format, a very similar structure. So, the example that I've constructed in this presentation is an example of a five-week class. And the way that a, the way that a five-week class is constructed is that you are given access to your classroom typically seven days before the, the start date for the class. And so what that does is it gives, it gives you a week to build your electronic classroom, to modify it to the style that you uh, would like to see. Uh, uh, you download your syllabus. You install assignments and quizzes or any term papers or projects that might, uh, might be relevant towards the end of the class. You set up your discussion forum questions uh, and uh, any other aspect of the class uh, any any announcements that you uh, plan to distribute on a regular basis? I, I've got a uh, when I teach a five week class, I have a list of announcements, and the online learning system allows you to post announcements well before the class starts, and just specify the date at which you'd like that announcement to actually appear. So you can really use that first week before the class starts to automate a lot of the process of your class, uh, so that as you go. Uh, you, if you have an announcement regarding a, an assignment in week three, for example, uh, that, uh, that announcement just automatically gets populated into the online course uh, without having to remember uh, to do something like that. So I've created a, a relatively extensive checklist of all of the items that I uh, install into my online classroom before the first day even begins uh, so that I make sure that all of those resources are, are available in the class and appear uh, in a timely manner. And the way that the classes are constructed, uh, again, they're divided into weeks. Uh, to, to relate that or to compare that to a traditional 15-week semester, uh, in fact, there was, uh, interestingly enough, there, was, uh, there were several semesters, in fact, two or three, where I was teaching a health and fitness class for the University of Phoenix and using exactly the same textbook for a course that I was teaching at Western Connecticut State University. So it gave me a very interesting comparison uh, of how the material in those, uh, in those two courses were, were, were covered by the two different uh, institutions. And so 
in the textbook that I used for that particular class, there were about 17 or 18 chapters, so approximately one chapter per week uh, in a traditional classroom. And I think I've, I've found that to be fairly true. It depends on the textbook. But um, in the online classroom, uh, if the class is a five-week class, and many of them are, uh, that, that, that type of, of time frame, four, five, six weeks, is usually pretty typical for the, the, the major online uh, schools. You'll typically cover two to three textbook chapters uh, per week. And each of those weeks includes uh, reading the chapters, of course. Uh, there, will, there will typically be at least one writing assignment uh, that draws in all of the concepts from uh, the chapters that are covered. And there are, are typically either a quiz or perhaps an exam uh, each week. And uh, then, of course, there are participation in uh, discussion forums. And for the University of Phoenix, and again, another reason why I switched my emphasis from, uh, from the University of Phoenix to Ashford University, uh, Ashford University puts a very high emphasis on uh, participation and discussion uh, by the students. In fact, uh, for the majority of their undergraduate classes, 51% of the students' grade is based on some form of participation or um, uh, involvement in discussion threads. So, so Ashford in particular really uh, has a, a very, very heavy f focus and emphasis on uh, that aspect of the class. So encouraging students to participate, making sure that they uh, participate in a sub substantive way. And by that, I mean at the very beginning of the class, you post um, a notification or an announcement. In Ashford University, they call it uh, instructor expectations. Uh, and so you post your instructor expectations at the beginning of the class and outline very clearly that, for example, for the statistics class that I teach, a substantive post from, uh, from a student is one that includes 250 words uh, initially, the initial post. Uh, and then responding to a classmate, um, you have certain requirements for that as well. Uh, a substantive response uh, includes not only a certain number of words, but also uh, a, a little bit of Socratic uh, questioning. Uh, in other words, you know, don't just uh, don't just tell your classmate, "Gee, this is a great post, add a boy, way to go, nice job." But maybe ask a question, uh, something that continues the the conversation, continues the dialogue, uh, so that there's uh, continued learning uh, that goes on. Uh, as part of a as part of an instructor's requirements for each of the weeks in an online classroom, an instructor has uh, a minimum participation that's expected. Uh, for my Ashford classes, for example, uh, my Ashford classes begin on Tuesdays, and students are required to submit their initial responses to a discussion question by Thursday, so by the end of the third day of the week. As an instructor, I'm required then to respond on it, to post at least two responses to students on at least three days. So in other words, six responses to students. Uh, and so what I typically try to do is I try to beat that uh, by at least one day and by at least two posts, uh, just to make sure that I get in the habit of always uh, more than meeting uh, the minimum requirements. So in other words, beginning on Thursday of each week, I try to go Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So I try to go four days uh, and submitting at least two, but preferably three uh, responses to students so that by the time uh, I get to the end of Saturday, I've at least fulfilled my requirements, uh, and then I leave Sunday uh, as a day when I can continue to participate in the discussion if, I, if, if my time uh, permits, uh, and I typically do uh, continue with, uh, with the discussion on a Sunday. Uh, but just in case, you know, one, of the, one of the nice things about teaching in the online environment is, is flexibility. And if you have fulfilled your requirements for the week and it's Saturday and you happen to be traveling on a Sunday or something like that, uh, then you don't have the, the stress and the pressure of, of trying to fulfill requirements um, uh, on a day that it might otherwise be, uh, be difficult to do. And there, the requirements for instructors are very, very clearly spelled out. One of the things that we all receive during our, our, our training uh, and certainly then our mentors uh, when we taught our first class and had a mentor, they reinforce the faculty handbook 
and the different documentation and, and pieces of, of well, the, the other resources that we have uh, that spell out very clearly what the requirements are uh, for uh, the instructors. In other words, when are grades due each week? So for example, with Ashford University, writing assignments are due on Sunday, uh, I'm sorry, on Monday night. Um, the, the next week begins on Tuesday, so uh, assignments for the week are due on Monday. Um, I have until Saturday of the following week to grade uh, writing assignments. For participation grades, again, the, the week ends on a, on a Monday night, and all participation for that particular week ends on Monday night. Uh, I have to have participation grades posted by Thursday. Uh, so there, but th those uh, those guidelines and instructions are very, very uh, clearly spelled out. There's not, there, there's really not any gray area. There's no, no confusion, no mis miscommunication. Um, everything's uh, everything in that regard is pretty straightforward. So let's see. We'll continue with uh, with the example that we're looking at for the online class structure. Uh, once the class begins. Um, or uh, I'm sorry, so the, some of the specific items uh, that I post uh, before day one, before the actual class begins. I always post a welcome announcement. Um, if there are any changes that need to be made to the syllabus, uh, you open up your grade book and, and, and establish grading uh, scales and numbers for all of your assignments and quizzes. I post a bio, an introduction uh, to, uh, to the students that explains who I am, uh, my experience is teaching a little bit about me personally, my hobbies, and just to you know, just to make the online classroom a little bit more personal and personable. Uh, I make sure that I post a, a photo of a fairly recent photo of myself uh, so that they can just just eyeball me and see who I am. And then I also post uh, really every resource, every piece of material, every resource that the students are going to need. Uh, to be successful for week one, all of the expectations uh, that they're that they're going to see. I just want to make sure that, especially in week one, uh, that everything the students need is up and ready to go before the uh, before the first day starts. And then on week one is just a little bit different than than the rest of the weeks, mostly because uh, you include. Uh, the students introducing themselves to the rest of the class, uh, both for the University of Phoenix and for Ashford University, that was a critical component in the uh, the introduction to the class was making sure that the students introduce themselves to their classmates and introduce themselves to the instructor, uh, and then the instructor is required to respond to every student's uh, uh, introduction, but but just briefly, it doesn't have to be a a, a real lengthy. Uh, response. There are typically two discussion questions each week, so you make sure that the discuss, discussion questions are are posted, and that the students understand exactly what the what the requirements are. Uh, again, what their deadlines are. They need to have, in the case of Ashford University, they have to have their initial response to the discussion question posted by Thursday. That allows their classmates Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, so four days to post responses to those initial uh, uh, posts. And then each student's required to submit a substantive response to at least three of their classmates. Um, and they certainly can do more than three. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that we watch out for as instructors is making sure that they are posting responses to three different classmates. Every once in a while, you'll end up with uh, students who perhaps had classes together before or at some point during the course become friends and if they just you know bounce some uh, some chatter back and forth between each other uh, they could relatively quickly meet the minimum requirements for discussion but not really uh, involving the entire class so uh, part of the instructor's responsibility is to make sure that not only are, are people responding but they're responding to a variety of their classmates and really uh, responding in a way that continues uh, the dialogue and the conversation on the topic for the week. Uh, and I also uh, it listed here the, the requirements that I have responding to at least students on at, at least two students uh, on at least three separate days. But again, those are the minimum requirements and I try to, I try to make sure that I've m more than met those requirements well before the, the, the final day of the week. There's always one 
one writing assignment due. Uh, if your week ends on a Sunday, it's due Sunday night. In the case of Ashford University, um, my, that week ends on a Monday. Um, so the writing assignments and quizzes are typically due on whatever happens to be the last day of the week. Uh, and so part of setting up your, your classroom uh, before the first day even starts in the thing that I call in instructor expectations is outlining what your late policy is going to be. And if you have writing assignments that are due at midnight on Sunday night or quizzes that are due on, uh, at that same time, um, what if? You know, what if a student hands in the, uh, the paper at noon on Monday? So effectively, it's a day late. Uh, as long as you've outlined your late policy uh, up front at the beginning of the class, then they're really uh, typically there aren't uh, aren't any problems. The the late policy that I typically implement is I take off 10% a day for three days, uh, so you can be up to three days late. Uh, I will take off 10% of your grade per day if you write an exceptional paper and get 100% and you're three days late. Uh, the highest score you can receive is a 70. But after three days. Uh, that's the cutoff. Uh, the, the, the problem with online courses in particular that only extend for five weeks, if you were to allow someone too much leeway, you really jeopardize their ability to stay uh, on top of the current week's work uh, and it can just really snowball. If you let somebody get three, four, five, six days behind in week one, and then that pushes week two to the point where they are late and behind. Uh, it's in a five-week course. It's much much tougher to uh, to recover. Now the the exception to that, and again with all online universities that I that I've had experience with, this has been the same. There will be students who have learning disabilities, and the online schools do a very good job of documenting that and. Typically what will happen, the, the week before my course starts, I'll receive notification on any students who have been granted extra time, uh, extra time for discussions, uh, extra time for assignments, uh, and even extra time for quizzes. Uh, and so then I, I'm able to go in through the online classroom system and make those changes to that student's account. So I don't, again, I don't even really have to give it a second thought. Uh, the the online classroom allows me to modify the uh, the deadlines and due dates for each individual student. Uh, so if I have a student who, say, gets time and a half uh, for an assignment, uh, I just populate that out throughout the classroom, and that student then uh, has effectively different due dates uh, than everybody else. Uh, and so uh, part of working in an online classroom is the luxury of having uh, technology available to help you with, uh, with situations like that. Uh, so grading uh, for week one then happens while you're in the middle of week two. So week one is a little bit different because you're not currently involved in grading anything from a previous week, you're only participating in the discussion. And so I actually find that weeks two, three, four, and five uh, of an online class are the ones that are the most difficult. Uh, the first week is relatively easy because you're participating in discussions, but you don't have any grading. And the week following week five, you're not participating in any discussions, but you're only grading whatever the final assignment was for the class. So the middle weeks in an online course uh, involve both grading the previous week as well as participating uh, in the current week. So for example, in, in, in week two, you would be grading the assignments from week one, but also still fulfilling your, um, your participation requirements uh, within week two. And so those middle weeks, uh, again, I, I keep posting announcements. Um, for the week before the week begins that uh, indicate the expectations for the week. Um, I continue to grade the previous week's work and post those grades and I continue to participate uh, in the discussions. Uh, and one of the things that I try to accomplish with my participation, uh, again one of the requirements that an instructor has is that you, you have to engage every student 
uh, a minimum number of times throughout the five weeks. For Ashford University, uh, I only have to engage a student a minimum of one time throughout the five weeks. The University of Phoenix requirements were, were a little greater than that, two and sometimes three. There again, I believe, my own personal belief is that if, if an instructor responds to a student only one time in five weeks, uh, quite frankly, if I were that student, I would feel ignored. Uh, and so I, I'm not able to respond. If I have a class of 15 to 20 students in a statistics class, for example, I, I'm not able to respond to all, all 15 of them every week. But I, what I try to do is I try to make sure that a student doesn't go more than three weeks uh, without hearing from me personally. Uh, and so, for example, the students who I respond to in week one, I then try to respond to a different subset of students in week two, and then go back to my original group in week three so that students don't go too long uh, without, uh, without hearing from me specifically. And then that helps me uh, fulfill my minimum requirements uh, as an instructor. Um, because at the end of a course, I'm not only evaluated by the students, there is an end of course survey that's uh, completed by the students. Uh, I'm also evaluated by, uh, by the university based on, uh, based on the criteria that are set forth for the class for participation, uh, timeliness of grading, uh, and things like that. Uh, and so I, 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 you know, which I guess again is a little bit different than a regular, than, you know, than teaching in a, in a traditional uh, classroom setting where your department chair might offer you a performance evaluation once a year. I get a performance evaluation every five weeks uh, from uh, from teaching in an online environment. So after the five weeks ends, uh, there, if if there are any students who still uh, have been given. Uh, extra time, you may have some students who are continuing to participate in, in, in discussions or who may have uh, some assignments that come in after the final day of the class. But the hard deadline for every student, regardless of how much extra time they've been given, uh, is when final grades are, are, are due. And so I spend the, the, the time during the week after the final day of the class uh, grading all of the final writing assignments. Some classes it's a project, a PowerPoint presentation, or something like that. And I have those, uh, the, my, the, the, the deadline for those will be on Saturday if final grades are due on Sunday. Uh, and so uh, on the day when final grades are due, effectively, if a student has not yet handed in an assignment, uh, quite frankly, the the online classroom um, becomes well. It, it's not like it, it doesn't turn off, but it becomes inaccessible once the once the final day is over. I can go back and I can view that classroom. I can see the class materials, but I no longer have the ability uh, to change grades or make any adjustments to the grade book. So it's a pretty hard deadline. Uh, any students who don't have an assignment in, uh, quite frankly. There's nothing I can do but give them a zero. And one of the things that I uh, counsel uh, all of my online students, I, I, you know, I tell them, uh, it, even if you submit something that you think is horrible, I may still find a few gems in that bit of horribleness and be able to assign a few points. And you might find that, that those might be just enough points to pass the class. But if you submit nothing at all, I have absolutely no... Uh, no option other than giving that student a zero uh, for that particular assignment. So uh, in particular with final grades, uh, I, I make sure that I, I encourage students as much as I possibly can uh, to submit um, all of their work for, for week five uh, before my hard deadline. So, so that's, that's a synopsis of how a, a typical class w works uh, during a five-week period. Um, I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes now talking about some ideas that I've picked up along the way, either from my own experience or from my mentors or from colleagues uh, about ways to make teaching in an online environment easier. One of the things that I learned very, very early uh, is that you can prepare virtually uh, everything that you need for a class uh, before the class ever begins. 
some of those things are items that you're going to use again and again and again, like an instructor bio. Uh, there are certain announcements that you might have. Uh, the statistics class that I teach, I find that there are just are certain items that the students need to be reminded about. And so I have recurring announcements. Um, the, my outlines for the weeks, uh, when you teach the same class, unless the curriculum or the content for the class changes, uh, the outline really stays uh, very, very much the same. So I keep all of those things stored uh, on my local computer uh, in a way that I can retrieve them easily and import them into the online classroom uh, pretty quickly. You have an entire week to set up your classroom, but if you've got everything streamlined as much as possible, that time uh, really, uh, the, the time that it takes to construct your online classroom uh, it really doesn't have to be uh, all that great. Um, one other thing that I personally do, uh, and I, I don't know a lot of other online instructors who do this, but I found this to be a, a really, really big help for me, participating in discussion threads. Uh, there's a certain expectation for the instructor to participate in a very, in a substantive way, to uh, uh, to cite research, to pose questions to students that continue a conversation, uh, to, to be scholarly. And you know what? That can take some time, quite frankly, doing research. And uh, you know what? I, it, it's hard every week to be brilliant, and I'm not. And so what I do is I literally have created a database. I save every response. So every Every response that I've ever written uh, to a student during a discussion thread or during uh, on a discussion topic, I save that because there's a good chance that six months from now, three months from now, two classes from now, I'm going to have a student who's going to respond to the discussion question in a similar way. The, the discussion questions are on specific topics. Sometimes they are on topics that ask the student an opinion. Uh, sometimes they are on topics that ask students to do a little bit of research and report back on research that they've, uh, that they've done. Um, but by having a database of already written uh, discussion posts or responses, I really saved myself a ton of time. Now, I quite frequently will go in and I'll make some minor modifications, especially if I've included the student's name in any way uh, into that response. Uh, I absolutely go in and, and, and tweak it and, and make some minor adjustments. But having a repository, having a database of uh, already written uh, responses to students, uh, just it saves me many, many hours uh, in a week and gives me the ability to respond substantively to my students um, in much greater detail uh, and much more thoroughly uh, than I otherwise might be able to. Um, some other class materials that can make online teaching a little bit easier, having a file structure set up so that you store things specific to each of the classes that you teach. So in other words, I have a subdirectory uh, for the uh, statistics class that I teach for Ashford University. Um, it's Statistics 325. I have a subdirectory underneath on, on my computer underneath my main directory for uh, Statistics 325 uh, that relates to the, it, and it's named by the date of the first day of the class. Uh, and in that directory I have uh, an electronic version of the, so, so I keep a, an external version of my gradebook on my local computer, just to have a redundant copy uh, of my gradebook, just in case something happens. I, I like to have backups, and so I keep a, an external redundant copy of my gradebook uh, just in case. Uh, it's in an Excel spreadsheet. I also keep my checklist of all of the requirements, uh, all all of the requirements that I have, um, my participation requirements, my grading requirements, uh, any announcements that I'm required to make to the class. Uh, and I honestly just use a very simple Microsoft Word document that has those requirements listed one week on a page. And I just, uh, I, I literally go through and check those, uh, check those requirements off to make sure that I've fulfilled all of my requirements and met the minimum 
uh, requirements uh, at the very least. And I also keep anything like the, uh, the you know the contract that that the university sends me. Uh, that is my contract for teaching that particular class. Uh, typically, those come in PDF form or, or, or something like that. So I make sure that I keep uh, keep a copy of that uh, just in case I need to need to find it. Some other class materials that I uh, that I tend to archive and save any any YouTube videos. I found a repository specifically for uh, statistics lectures uh, that are five to ten minute. Uh, videos that I've found uh, are very, very good. Uh, unfortunately, the textbook that Ashford University has selected for the statistics class that I teach, I'm not very fond of, frankly. And I have found some YouTube videos that explain correlation and regression or things like that uh, in terms that I think the students understand better uh, than the explanation in the textbook. So I keep online videos available and post those and make them available to the students uh, because I can just anticipate uh, the questions that I'm going to get in week three uh, about uh, correlation and regression and I know that the YouTube videos are going to are, are going to help me with that. Any grading rubrics that I have for the assignments I, I keep those so that I can can modify and tweak them as needed uh, and any other just sort of generic feedback. One of the things in the online classroom is that you uh, give a lot of feedback to the students to encourage uh, encourage their work, encourage them to stay in, engaged and involved in the class. And so if I have any, for a, for a writing assignment, for example, if somebody has done particularly well and, and really hit all of the major points, you know, quite frankly, anybody who's done any grading, you know that the, 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 the it's the it's the assignments that are bad that are the ones that require the most comment and the most direction and often take the most effort on the part of the instructor the assignments that are really good and meet all of the uh, requirements from the assignment description uh, you know it gets kind of boring to just keep saying good job well done nicely said uh, and things like that so uh, what I try to do is I try to have a uh, a comment that I post at the end of an assignment like that that's a little more uh, a little more descriptive uh, and a little bit more congratulatory uh, and and speaks specifically about the items from the assignment and how that student did well so I keep a I keep a version of that because I find that if I have two or three exceptional students in a class why retype that three or four times two three four times um, and say the same thing over and over again. So anything that you find that might even be a little bit redundant uh, in your work, saving that so that you don't have to, to rekey it uh, makes a big difference in the time that you take. So for discussion forums, um, and again, Ashford University puts a, a heavy emphasis on discussion forums, 51% of the grade. Uh, typically, there is at least one discussion question uh, per major topic or chapter, so that usually means two, sometimes three, but usually one or two uh, discussion questions per week. Uh, each student's required to post one initial response uh, and then is also required to respond to their classmates. Uh, for Ashford University, it's three times. Uh, some classes, uh, some, uh, sometimes it's uh, University of Phoenix, it's two. Uh, but that's intended to, to keep a dialogue going uh, of the uh, you know for the topic uh, again the instructor has participation requirements as well and the instructor is really there to um, to monitor the, the discussion threads to keep the discussion going use uh, you know to encourage critical thinking use the Socratic method to ask questions that that perhaps cause the student to think a little bit more or research a little bit more uh, on that topic. And you're also sort of the referee, uh, checking any inaccuracies, uh, correcting any, you know, if students start to say, students will frequently start to state something as if it is a fact. And in fact, it's their opinion. And they haven't actually done any research. It's just their opinion. Uh, so to some degree, 
uh, it's the instructor's responsibility to act as a referee to point out uh, what is opinion uh, and not fact, and if possible, perhaps to uh, include facts um, in a nice way, <laughs> not, not in a way that uh, demeans the student or embarrasses the student, uh, but just as a means to, uh, to, to keep everything uh, accurate. So other resources that I have found uh, you know, very helpful in the online uh, teaching world, 24-hour technical support for both uh, the faculty and for the students. Um, students all have access to uh, financial aid counseling, very much like they would uh, at a traditional school. And in particular, at, at Ashford University, their Office of Student Success, they call it, uh, it's their disability assistance program, uh, is really exceptional. Ashford University uh, puts a very, very large focus on attracting and recruiting students with physical disabilities. Uh, I've had students, uh, one of my best students has no, um, had, one of my best students had no fingers and no toes and was absolutely great. Would not have uh, fared well in a traditional classroom, did very, very well uh, in the online environment. Uh, career services for uh, the online schools are, are, are extensive. Uh, I've also found that the uh, library with access to databases, uh, in particular at Ashford University, is really very similar to what we have here uh, at Mount St. Mary College with tutors and librarians and people who are on call to help the students uh, with every part of the, the, the learning process, the research process. Ashford University has a student writing center uh, with tutors and people who will not write papers for you, but they'll take work that you've been working on, help proofread, uh, offer suggestions on uh, improving your writing. And then, of course, uh, Ashford uses Turnitin, which is a, an anti-plagiarism uh, software program. Uh, I, I, the, the grading program, the grading system that uh, Ashford University now uses actually runs all of the students' papers through Turnitin um, automatically. So for every paper that I grade uh, for Ashford University now, when I pull that uh, file up, when I pull up the, the, the paper, the written assignment to grade it, uh, one of the very first things I see in my grading window is, it, is the Turnitin score for uh, that particular assignment. And I, you know, basically anything that's 25% uh, or greater, I, I do a little bit more, you know, I look at it a little bit more closely. Anything under 25% um, because, uh, you know, the students all access the, uh, the Ashford Library and things like that. And that's about, that's been about my, um, my threshold uh, has been about 25%. And so, uh, kind of to wrap things up and to you know allow some time for folks to ask any questions that you might have, uh, one of the things that I've been uh, one of the things that's been most satisfying for me about teaching in the online vi online environment, one of the things that really changed my mind from my initial impression uh, of uh, teaching online uh, is that I realized that. Online classrooms and online schools provide an opportunity for a great number of students who wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity uh, to, to, uh, to go to school. And I've had the conversation with people before, uh, people who teach in a traditional classroom setting and are worried that uh, online education might be the wave of the future, the way of the future. And, and I disagree with that. I think that there is always going to be a place for a traditional classroom. I think that there are always going to be students and faculty who thrive on a college campus, living in the dorms, teaching in a regular classroom. But the thing that an online classroom does is it provides opportunities for people who don't have access to that environment. Um, uh, I taught a statistics class last spring. There were 19 students and only two of them were in North America. Many of them were military personnel uh, stationed in places like Okinawa, Munich, Germany. Uh, I had two uh, in that particular class. I had two who were on active duty in Iraq at the time. Um, and so uh, 
military personnel are uh, a fairly large percentage of the students at Ashford University and also their spouses, uh, military spouses also. Uh, you know, that, that requirement that they have to move every couple of years to their next, uh, to their next station, to their next deployment um, makes it very, very difficult for anybody in the military to attend a four-year uh, university. I've also found a lot of adults uh, with careers and families who are looking for a way to change their career. They can't take time out to go to school during the day. And it, it's difficult for them to even find time to, to take evening classes at their local community college or, 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 or you know, college or university. But the online asynchronous environment allows them to pursue their degree uh, any time of the day or night, whatever, whatever works best for them. Um, I've, got a, I've had a number of retired adults. I think the oldest uh, student who I've met has been 82 years old. She was a, a grandmother from uh, from uh, Mississippi, and she uh, a great grandmother, in fact, actually. And she was completing her undergraduate degree in social work and was hoping to be a hoping to be a social worker in her retirement. Um, and then also, uh, and again, Ashford University specifically uh, very much recruits students with disabilities, students who would otherwise lack. Uh, the ability to travel to a traditional college classroom uh, and participate uh, in in a traditional classroom. So it's really been very re rewarding for me to provide uh, the opportunities uh, and I hope uh, a quality uh, education or educational experience for the students who uh, who come to my online classrooms. So that that really wraps up the uh, the, the the presentation portion. Uh, of this webinar. We've got a few more minutes and I, since I don't teach on Tuesdays, I'm more than happy to stay beyond uh, the end of our, our time together. If, uh, if, if we get a lot of questions, if we get no questions, that's fine too. But uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Uh, if you aren't available to ask any questions at this time, if you are hearing this webinar uh, in its recorded form. If you would ever like to send me a, a, a question regarding uh, online education, my email address is scott.russell at msmc.edu. That's S-C-O-T-T -T dot R-U-S-S-E-L-L -S -L at msmc.edu. Uh, so um, feel free to ask, uh, ask any questions after the fact if you're hearing this sometime after uh, Tuesday, October the 25th. Um, so let's see. From Tom Myers, I have a question. Uh, how do you work with uh, the student who doesn't like their final grade? Uh, well, Tom, to answer your question, and I don't. Let me just ask real quickly. Am I supposed to type my response, or can I speak to Tom's? I can speak. So, so Tom, I'm going to go ahead and just speak because I can speak much more quickly than I can type. Um, the, the, uh, every university requires, uh, I'm sorry, requires is not the right word. Every university allows the student the opportunity to uh, contest a grade if they choose. Uh, if a student doesn't agree with the final grade that I've given, uh, there's simply an online form that they can submit uh, and they can ask for uh, the, uh, the department for which I teach uh, there, there's a like a like my like the school of business here. Uh, my department chair uh, would review that request uh, and speak to me about that student and about that student's work and see if um, if there's any basis for the uh, for the student's complaint. So, uh, in the online environment, the student would simply fill out a uh, a request uh, to have their final grade reviewed by the department chair. Uh, the department chair, in my case at Ashford University, would uh, email or perhaps even call me on the phone, but typically email uh, and discuss the situation with me before uh, rendering a decision. And, and in the case of Ashford, Ashford University, it's the department chair who would then uh, uh, render the decision on whether the grade is going to be changed and, and, and then actually make the grade change itself. Uh, so that's how students have recourse on, um, yeah, if I'm, if I'm, particularly harsh, if they think I'm particularly harsh. Um, okay, so uh, if anyone else has any quick questions, I know we are approaching the end of our time together. 
Uh, I don't sing and I don't dance, so I'm not going to waste anybody's time or continue to uh, fill the airwaves here. Um, again, if, if you have any questions after this webinar is completed, uh, feel, please feel free to email me. I'm always happy to discuss my experiences uh, and uh, you know, trade any stories or experiences that you might have. So I think with that, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll call it quits. Thank you very much. I hope that this has been at least partially beneficial. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.